Hello and welcome to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore the emerging field of data science. We bring the best minds in data, software engineering, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Now here are your hosts, Frank Lavinia and Andy Leonard. Hello and welcome back to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore the emerging fields of data science, machine learning and artificial intelligence. If you like to think of data as the new oil, then you can consider us car talk because we focus on where the rubber meets the virtual road of the information superhighway. And Andy, I think I think that cliche of information superhighway is kind of way played out. What do you think? I don't know. I mean, when when did that come up? Wasn't it back in the Al Gore days? Like in the nineties, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Al Gore version one, that is. Yeah. <laughs> so- <laughs> So weren't you still in school in the 90s, Frank? I was. I That's was what I thought. Yes, I'm yeah. old. I was not. <laughs> but that's not true. I actually finished uh, an associate's degree in 94. Oh, there you go. Yeah, it only took me six years. So that should count, but, you know. There you go. The <laughs> The real question is, was Kurt Cobain alive? Well, that's the real question. Uh, that's a, that is an interesting question. <laughs> You you would go to Kurt Cobain. I would go to Keith Richards, and oh, he's still alive, isn't he? Well, I'm not sure about that. I wonder. I wonder if they should have buried him when he died. I'm just. I don't know. Or uh, I guess he's changing the definition of life as he, we speak. He could be, but he's looked the same since I don't know the seventies or something. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the deal? Oh, I'm. Frank, I've been coding like crazy. We've got a bunch of new stuff going on at Enterprise Data and Analytics and Data Integration Lifecycle Management Suite, DILM Suite. We just released a new version of Catalog Compare. It talks to the cloud. Um, it just does really neat stuff. And it's, I love this. I love uh, software development. Um, and it's its just so much fun solving problems. You know, that's the thing. So, uh, I know you've been traveling some recently. What's up with you? Yeah, so uh, last week I was in um, Bellevue, Washington at a super secret uh, Microsoft AI training event. Is it even uh, allowed for you to say you were at a super secret? Microsoft? It actually wasn't as super secret as I thought it was. Uh, so okay. I actually I actually recorded a, a, a live stream there. And um, no one, everyone, I shared it with the group and it was like, wow, that's really cool. Nice. So unfortunately, we were so busy, I didn't get a chance to record a second one, but uh it was definitely interesting. Probably some of the stuff there I can't talk about, but um, it was, uh, I took the red eye as soon as it was over and came home for my birthday. So that was nice. nice. Happy belated birthday, by the way. Thank you very much. Thank yep. you very much. So I, speaking, uh, was, go ahead. Okay. No, no, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, I was just going to segue, you know, as you were, we were speaking of uh, super secret stuff. Our guest today, Milena Robban, uh, did I say your name, your last name correctly? Yep, Melinda Rodband. And okay, good enough. Is a is a cyber security. Um, uh, it's, well, sorry, you work at a cyber security firm, but your job title is is really a mouthful: senior security consultant uh, in the geopolitical risk practice. That's right. And that's a, is that Versprite? Is that how you say the company name? That's right, Versprite. Wow. So I have. Absolutely no idea what a senior security consultant uh, in a geopolitical risk practice would do. Well, but we do agree that sounds super awesome. Though. It does. I'm happy to share. Uh, basically, <laughs> um, I've, I've spent my entire career, um, about nine years so far, in the political risk field, helping businesses of all types understand how changing environments, both in terms of business, legal, regulatory, and tax frameworks, for example, and security, you know, terrorist attacks, labor protests, things of that nature, could affect their business continuity and their operations. And to help them understand how these issues come into play when they're expanding to a new market, or thinking of how to formulate a new strategy for launching a product. Um, and basically, uh, what we've we've come to realize over time is that 
the issues that we're talking about when we're talking about cybersecurity, when we're talking about AI and data and all of that, they tie in very nicely with these topics. Uh, what we've seen recently is a rash of attacks on data motivated by geopolitical motivations, whether they're state-sponsored um, intelligence agencies or they're people who are looking for sensitive information that they can use and steal and gain advantage from geopolitically. Um, you're, you're all, I'm sure, aware of the Huawei, uh, you know, hoopla, as I like to call it. Um, you know, <laughs> we, we've we seen all of this concern over whether uh, Huawei hardware is spying on you, whether the firmware and the software are, uh, you know, inclusive of the backdoors that allow the Chinese government to steal intellectual property and gain, you know, an unfair competitive advantage. But there are lots of other issues at play here. And everybody from the company that runs your kid's daycare, who is taking pictures of your kids, recording everything they eat and do and where they are and where they play, um, to, you know, Fitbit, which was monitoring soldiers in, uh, you know, on secret uh, bases overseas. Every one of these companies holds data that is valuable to someone. And, you know, if you steal enough data from enough different sources, you could really paint yourself a very, very interesting picture and gain all kinds of advantage from that. And especially in a time of, you know, geopolitical flux, as I like to call it, where we see norms that have existed for a long time start to break down a bit or to change we see different dangers coming up in different markets all over the world, but we're also seeing opportunities and businesses need to start incorporating that type of insight when they're thinking of where to go, where to operate, how to operate intelligently and successfully and to raise, you know, all of the issues that I'm talking about ahead of time to make sure that they're not caught off guard later on. So what, what can companies and, and organizations do to mitigate the risk of something like Huawei uh, uh, I mean, obviously, unplugging and disconnecting everything is not really an option. What What are the alternatives? Well, in terms of something like Huawei, um, there are plenty of companies that have come to depend on it because the company very strategically, most likely with government support, was able to undercut all of their competition, the Ericsson's of the world, the Nokia's of the world, who used to provide telecommunications equipment. Um, and so people thought to themselves, I have a limited budget, I'm going to buy this. And now that's what my network relies on. Um, you know, very interestingly, or very obviously, the rural carriers, the very small carriers um, out in the Midwest, out in rural areas all over the world, they tend to be the ones who rely on that type of hardware. And they can't pivot immediately to a more expensive Ericsson or a Nokia alternative. And so what we're trying to get them to do is to think about it in terms of what are the realistic dangers, vetting all of their dependencies, understanding who their vendors are, understanding whether or not the code that they're using has been manipulated, getting someone to verify it for them and really taking stock of their situation. We're not obviously advocating that you run around your home, unplug everything and move into a Faraday cage. Uh, obviously, we have to be thoughtful about the way we go about it. And a lot of these transitions are not going to happen overnight. But we do think it is important for businesses to at least acknowledge that dependency and to be aware that in the long term, if they're collecting sensitive information, that is one avenue by which they could be attacked or compromised. And they're very you know, sensitive information lost. We saw the European Union go after this type of thing with uh, GDPR, the General Data Protection uh, Rules, which punish anyone for not revealing a breach, uh, which had been kind of common practice among all of these companies. If you look up and down the Fortune 500 list and you ask who has been breached, the answer is everybody. Uh, but not all of them have had to reveal it under pain of penalty and fine previously. Now there's more of a movement to try to get them to understand what is their, their exposure to all of this, where are their vulnerabilities, and to get them to confess, because people should be aware that their information could fall into the hands of a, a service abroad or a competing company or whatever it is that the, could be used against them. What we've seen very often in the cybersecurity realm is 
someone can access information from a seemingly innocuous source and then use that information to engage in very targeted phishing um, attempts and very targeted social engineering attempts to get information out of you to compromise your finances, to steal your credit card, to find out where you live and to, to potentially, you know, hack into your computer, you create a, a ransomware situation where you have to pay to unlock your own information. And sometimes they're not even going after very valuable information. I mean, they're just trying to make money, but sometimes they are. For example, you'll recall the attack against Atlanta uh, late last year, which paralyzed the city. I mean, think of all the information that you could get if you're a rival uh, intelligence agency. Think about all of the ways that you could compromise very sensitive information like people's medical records. If you attack a hospital and you hit them with a ransomware attack and they can't, you know, dispatch ambulances anymore because they can't use their dispatch service or they can't schedule surgeries because they can't look up patient records online. So we're seeing a tremendous increase in the number of these types of attacks. And so we, the real effort is to first get people to acknowledge then take stock, do a real assessment of where they might be vulnerable, and then to strategically think of ways where they can plug those holes, shore up their defenses, or as a last resort, invest in the type of insurance protection, um, cybersecurity insurance and the like, that could help them as a stopgap measure if things go really poorly. So that's an interesting question. So do you, do you has the resistance from organizational leadership kind of gone away as more and more of these breaches have been um, announced and declared? Well, it's a, really a mixed picture. There are a lot of people who seem to think that you can invest in some of these sort of passive monitoring and alert programs that sort of, you know, uh, probe your defenses on a regular schedule um, and tell you, you know, you have this many threats, sort of like your antivirus software right now. You don't really think about it. It runs in the background and it tells you if you need to take an action. Um, that really isn't enough. You know, uh, when we're talking about data, for example, everybody wants to use data. Everybody wants to buy data. Everyone wants to glean information from data. And that's great. But the thing is, that if you're a criminal, and you know that a target is relying on machine learning and programs that have learned from past attacks, your goal is then to innovate, to create new things that had not been trained on because it hadn't happened yet. And those programs will not catch new attempts that they've not been trained to identify and to recognize as an exploit, as an attack. And so there is a mix between people who just want to rely on the passive and there's increasingly more of a focus of wanting to go about it more actively. And that's sort of where I come in, where I design interactive simulations for my clients that help use data to help train their people to understand what is an attack? How do I recognize it? Or how do I verify that something is an attack versus, um, you know, infrastructure malfunction um, how do I understand if, uh, you know, a connectivity in an area going down is the result of a power failure that's a nefarious act or it's just a storm that happened? And how do I react to these different scenarios? You know, you, you would have different protocols in place to spin up redundant capabilities or to boost your capabilities, whether it's nefarious or it's just, you know, an infrastructure failure due to a, a power uh, you know, surge or a storm. Um, Just a good old fashioned accident, somebody tripping over a power cable or something right. versus something malicious. And we, we've seen where businesses try to take a backseat and they won't say anything until they figured it out. And those are the ones that usually are the passive type. They're waiting mm. for someone to tell them what's happening. The ones that are sort of getting ahead of the curve are the ones that are taking the more proactive approach. And they've already thought about some of these situations. And in my simulations, I try to use, you know, the, the subject matter experts who can help design these different, what I call injects or pieces of information that drive the narrative. And they're made to look as realistic as possible. They're really made to look with like what people would encounter on a daily basis in their daily work to help train them to recognize and to identify and to analyze and to verify the authenticity of something and then act. So is it like wargaming? It is a bit like wargaming, but typically in wargaming, 
you're pretending to be your own enemy or or you're pretending to be a, a bigger entity. In my simulations, you are what you do for a living. So if your job title is senior public relations executive, that's what you do. If your title is threat manager, that's who you are. There's no learning curve and there's no pretending you're this or that. You are tasked with doing with what you would do on a daily basis. And you get a chance to see how some of these geopolitical elements play into what you do on a daily basis and how to see your role through that lens, how to anticipate things. I'll give you an example. I worked with a tech firm where um, some of the engineers and the, the programmers were working on collecting a new piece of information. And I immediately flagged that as being very attractive to not only competitors, but, you know, state sponsored uh, groups and the like, and they didn't really understand why. So we built a simulation and we helped them understand how that piece of information was very valuable in certain hands. And they came out of it telling me, you know, you've completely changed my mind. And that is something that I love about my job. I, I love seeing that, seeing people experience something, getting them to change your mind, their minds and getting them to think about new ideas to get ahead of some of these things. You know, as an outsider, we can only do so much. As a consultant, we can only do so much. We don't know what you're faced with on a daily basis. But if we can inspire you to understand it through our lens, if we can inspire you to think of the solutions that you could actually implement, then then our job is done because we've made a real impact on you and we're not pushing a top-down approach. You're creating it based on what you think is right for your organization and the way that you work every day. So, Melina, um, at my consulting firm, we do data integration work, and we had uh, one of our consultants uh, accidentally clicked on a phishing email, mm -hmm. and the Trojan was downloaded about a, about a day and a half later. And what it appeared, or how it appeared to us, is that there was some automation involved, and it brought up a couple of interesting conversations internally because we do uh, automation. That's something that we build, uh, data-related automation. And, and I was curious, what happens when, number one, more of the bad actors start doing more automation? And number two, as it applies to what we talk about with guests here all the time, what happens when the bad actors begin using data science and machine learning and AI? Right. Well, that is definitely a worry um, in terms of automation, that that's already really happening. I mean, people are um, trying to use ransomware attacks because they're easy to deploy and you can sort of, it's sort of like scattershot, right? You don't have to do a lot of research. You can just deploy them to a lot of different compromise systems and see what happens. Right. Um, the, the cost per attack for the attacker has gone down dramatically because they can automate a lot of this. And because we're introducing new vulnerabilities every day. I mean, you've heard about all the nefarious botnets that have resulted from people's unsecured printers. Now we're going to have unsecured refrigerators and toasters and what whatnot that everybody's connecting to the internet for God only knows what reason, and which usually come to market without having prioritized security at all. Right. I mean, we what I've always said is that we need to take more of an approach to security the way that we approach baby products. You know, you wouldn't give something to a baby that hadn't been tested. Right. We, we really want to prioritize that this, this is safe before we give it to an infant. We need to take that same approach to things that we put in people's homes that are listening to them, that are recording them, that are storing information that, you know, think of the ways that you could exploit somebody. If you're a senior executive and you happen to have a mistress who comes to your pied-a-terre in the city on a regular basis and you have, happen to have a bunch of different listening devices to, to make your life easier, and now someone has gotten a hold of all your recordings, they could blackmail you to the end of time. Um, we, we just saw what happened with Jeff Bezos, and that wasn't a malicious attack. From what I understand, the text messages were given by someone voluntarily shared right. uh, by by the woman's brother but think about the ways that someone could have hacked into all these different 
devices that people have in their homes that they've never given a second thought to. I mean, I, I've started asking people when I enter their home, do you have one of those Echoes or Google Homes or whatever it is? Because I really want to be careful about what I would say and what I would want recorded about me and not mm. even sensitive information, but things like me telling people where I'm going to be or what I'm going to be doing, I think presents a danger. And I know it starts to sound paranoid, but on some level, if you're a person who's concerned about their safety, you have to start thinking about these things. And we need to do a much better job of educating the public. I mean, I talk to people every day who've never even heard of phishing attempts, uh, let alone given thought to some of these more, you know, deep thought issues when it comes to the tech that they're putting in their home. And of course, companies are manipulating that, right? If you're offered a free echo, you'll say, hey, why not? It's going to make my life easier. But you don't think necessarily about the dangers and they're not volunteering that information to you. Right. So the same way that you would ask a doctor, what are the side effects of this medication? We should be thinking about what are the side effects of introducing this technology into my home? Um, I think there was a, a couple of weeks ago, somebody hijacked somebody's uh, nest camera in their nursery and scared a bunch of people. I, these are things that could have potentially traumatic effects on small children, on the elderly. You know, imagine if you hijacked a couple of those devices and you broadcast that a ballistic missile missile attack was imminent or something like that, you could really cause harm. You could inundate a 911 dispatch system. You could cause massive panic. And we're voluntarily putting that into our homes without really considering the consequences. And I'm all for making lives easier. I'm all for using tech. I'm a big fan of tech. I'm not a Luddite by any means, but I do think we do need to prioritize the security element and we need to make a stance from a consumer standpoint and from our standpoint as people involved in the field of doing a good job of bringing more attention to these issues. And not just in theoretical terms. We have proof that these things can be compromised and what havoc they can wreak. No, that's true. It's a very sale. When you kind of start thinking about that, it becomes very sobering. Um you know, a big part of why I don't have a lot of home automation stuff aside from, you know, turn the light on, turn the light off type stuff is because I, 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 even if, you know, the people behind, uh, the Amazon Alexa, they have the most noble intentions. Uh, there are people out there with bad intentions exactly who, who will override that. And I think, I think you're right. I think the consumer awareness is kind of, I think part of that, but one of the things that I've kind of seen as a consistent theme over the last, well, for a long time, is we're a society increasingly dependent on technology, yet the average consumer person on the street has no clue about how to use technology. It's almost like we're we're asking for trouble. And is that being paranoid too, or am I got my finger on the pulse of something? No, I think you're absolutely right. I think, um, you know, the average 12 year old is a lot more technologically adept than your average 40 year old. And if the kids are learning all these different skills in class that they can then use to exploit different vulnerabilities, that's a worry too. I mean, if you look around the world, there are huge groups of relatively young people with very advanced hacking skills. And um, it, at my company, you know, we have a lot of people who are white hat hackers who've, you know, decided to come and work for good, helping companies secure themselves. But for every one of those, there are a thousand others who know how to use and exploit technology in a way that a lot of people simply can't and don't know how to protect against. And in countries where they don't have good job prospects or in countries where they're pressured to make a quick buck, you know, you could technically see a college student on the side, you know, running ransomware attacks to make a few bitcoins to use for personal expenses. Um, and, and we need to start thinking about that. There are plenty of people out there with skills that can, on a dime, flip to be the sort of nefarious type of threat instead of the type of people who are willing to come in and help provide security and help companies plug their holes in terms of security and in terms of some of these vulnerabilities that they've just never thought about. So it's a good time to be a bad guy. 
Yeah, it's definitely an easy time to be a bad guy. Um, <laughs> well, you know, they say cheaters never win, but right. we've we've seen quite a few of them make money and they're hard to catch. Some of these attacks are extremely hard to attribute. Uh, we've seen huge amounts of cryptocurrencies stolen. You know, a, a gentleman just died holding all the passwords to all the wallets that his company was in control of. And $190 million are gone. Um, and that's right. something that could have been prevented, right? That's something that we well, would have advised. Some of that, and it seems like, uh, I think it, I don't know, maybe I'm being, maybe I'm being a skeptic, but, um, you know, it's gone with a nudge and a wink. Uh, so somebody doesn't have to pay inheritance tax. I don't know. That's just. And it could be I, that. It could be for sure. But we're not just smell something funny there. But yeah, we're just not doing enough to make sure that people who are putting, you know, one guy put all his life savings in that and lost it all, you know, and right. we're not doing a good job of educating people before they do that. And he wasn't even trying to make a lot of money. He was just trying to transfer money from an American bank to a Canadian bank via a cryptocurrency exchange to make the process easier. Um, and he lost everything. So it wasn't just greed it was just somebody trying to transfer their life savings and now they're out a couple hundred thousand dollars um and you know it's great to experiment it's great to try out all of these things but increasingly you know you're seeing cryptocurrencies pop up all of these um you know icos happening and everything without a lot of thought to the ramifications if things go terribly wrong and we have quite enough history to tell us that things will go wrong and they will go wrong spectacularly if you're not prepared. This is true. So what, 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 what's a good first step for organizations and, and people interested in being more mindful of their privacy and, and, and defense like this? Well, there are a lot of different frameworks in place. Um, you know, the, the different NIST and, um, Octave and all those different frameworks for doing uh, an assessment of your company's information security uh, infrastructure, what data you hold, what you do with it, who has access to it. So that's really the first step is really understanding what are you working with? Where, where is the access? How many third party vendors are you relying on? Um, who controls them? Are they fronts for the Chinese government? Are they fronts for the North Korean government? Whoever it is, you really need to understand who your vendors are too. Um, third party risk is extremely uh, important in this type of thing. Um, and then it's you know educating your staff, starting at the beginning. What is a phishing attempt? What is a social engineering attack? You know, just getting down to the basics, and then helping your employees understand how to report things, how to ensure that you have a view into whether or not you're being attacked, how to identify the attack, and then bringing in the right people, either you know internally hiring a big robust team or outsourcing to a consulting firm that can do a managed service for you and help you monitor these things and remediate your vulnerabilities in a timely manner. Well, that's a, that's a number of, uh, of really good steps. And uh, I'm sure our listeners are uh, appreciate hearing that from someone with, um, with your skills and experience. Um, it, it's, it's a huge it's a huge deal and and what you do I think is just incredible um, and I, I don't really have that kind of security mind although being paranoid is an engineering virtue I will say that <laughs> I think I've got the paranoia part down uh, there's there's a number of questions that we like to ask our guests uh, Melena and uh, the first one is, uh, how did you find your way into this field? Did this field find you or did you find it? Well, uh, both, I guess. Um, I was always really interested in ways of finding data, of finding information and being able to make sense of it, putting it together in, in new ways. Um, and uh, part of my work, you know, working with big clients was helping them make sense of data and helping them understand different economic indicators and things like that. Um, and I, I realized very early on that my fellow analysts were also, you know, 
forced to work with data, but they didn't quite understand how to source it, how to verify it, how to reproduce it, um, what methodologies they could undertake to analyze it. And uh, for a while on Twitter, I was sort of calling out um, very bad data under the hashtag ban data torture, where I would see people <laughs> sort of trying to massage data to tell them anything they wanted it to hear, the same way you torture a suspect to tell you pretty much anything that you want to hear. And uh, I found that people really didn't have a good foundation in that. Um, you know, people in in the geopolitical risk realm are, are largely people who took international relations and political risk and political science courses, and they didn't really do a lot of math and statistics and economics. And so I started actually part of the simulation origin stories. I started helping analysts understand where data came from, how to figure out if it was useful how to figure out if it had been tortured. Uh, because in, a lot of times the things we're talking about, we're talking about, you know, a coup or regime change or war, the end is very small. And right. to really elucidate yeah. anything from it, you sort of have to multiply it and, and expand it and create broader definitions and then work it like dough until you get something out of it. And so I, I was really trying to educate them on how they could understand it and how they could ask the right questions about where information comes from. But too often people don't ask that question. Where is this from? Was it in any way, you know, politically massaged? We tend to think of like government statistics as the the end all be all of data that is publicly available, but we've seen you know the Venezuelan government has uh, fundamentally changed the way they define certain things, right. and you can't compare information from 2017 to information that you had from 2007. And so really understanding what you're working with is very important. And so it kind of grew out of that. And out of my insistence that the work we do be really intellectually honest and grounded in methodology and not just, I feel like this guy might win this election or I feel like that war is likely to break out, really trying to find some sort of methodological grounding. Um, and so Dada and I are sort of uh, in an uneasy relationship, but we're, we're working through it. And I think every tool that comes along that helps us make sense of data is really interesting. Um, I was recently, I came across uh, the story of Enigma, which is a company that was founded by two philosophy students out of Columbia University. And what they're trying to do is take all the publicly available da data that's out there and allow you to play with it and find different things that you might not have seen if you were just looking at the different pieces in disparate form. So it's sort of like the conspiracy theory with the colored strings and the post-it notes and the index cards on the wall, but in a much more accessible fashion. Um, and so that's sort of the thing that I'm, I'm most excited about is being able to do it that way and being able to bring data together that has never been brought together, that no one had thought of bringing together to find out what we can learn from, from all of that. Um, and of course, there are people who are doing it poorly. I mean, people who uh, will tell you, I'm, I'm able to predict something that probably already happened. Um, and, but then there's, you know, there's a lot of complexity involved in all of this. Um, and for political risk as a whole, you know, training again on what happened in the past is not necessarily indicative of what we're going to face in the future. Oh, sure. The way that the Arab Spring started might not be the way that, you know, spring comes to South America, for example, or to parts of Africa or to parts of Asia. And so training, you know, coding different world events and training machines, for lack of a better term, to try to predict the future that way isn't really going to work. But finding ways to seek new information, verify it, and then put it together with other information is likely to yield connections that we hadn't seen before. And if they don't predict the future, they could at least give us ways of conceptualizing different scenarios that we can consider likely in the future or that we can prepare for. Wow. It uh, reminds me a lot of Nicholas Nassim Taleb's uh, Black Swan. Yeah. yeah, I'm a big fan of his. And cool. of course, the real Black Swan, you wouldn't be able to predict. That's the nature of Black Swan. But uh, uh, an expert named Michelle Wucker um, wrote something called Grey Rhino, which is about events that we can sort of foresee. Like we can 
foresee antibiotic resistance causing massive problems in the world and we're not really prepared to handle something like that or a massive plague or outbreak of disease um, you know we know that it could happen but we haven't yet formulated the infrastructure and the institutions to deal with that problem when it actually comes so there's black swans there's gray rhinos and there are things that are staring us right in the face that we haven't even prepared for yet either uh, which we need to do a better job of of doing and data i think correctly used correctly sourced and verified can take us a long way to, towards getting there and towards convincing the right people that it's important you know if you have data to back you up your case is much more likely to get the attention of an executive um, who's willing to open the purse strings to help you hmm, that's true so our next question is, what's your favorite part of your current gig? I think you kind of touched on some of those elements. Yeah, I, I would definitely say the creativity element, you know, thinking up different scenarios for my clients to have to contend with. That part is really exciting for me. Um, and again, seeing their minds change and seeing how they start out sort of skeptical and then leave having really contributed in a substantial way. That's really exciting for me. Very cool. So we have uh, three complete this sentence. Um, when I'm not working, I enjoy what? I enjoy playing tennis, which has benefited a great deal from data and data analytics. Um, I, it gives me great joy to see the way that you know IBM has integrated data into different tennis competitions and how you can see things that you you know a casual observer wouldn't be able to see but you can see how someone favors a different stroke or a different part of the court and it's really cool to see that hmm. um, and I've tried to incorporate that into my game but um, I'm a long way off but Roger Federer if you're listening I'd love to play <laughs> <laughs> Uh, here's another complete this sentence. I think the coolest thing in technology today is? Without a doubt, the coolest thing is the ability to connect with people who I honestly would not have crossed paths with otherwise. I mean, I've had the pleasure of using Twitter to connect with people from different parts of the world um, in different stages in their career that I would have never met at a conference or an event, but now I've had the opportunity to work with them to benefit from their tremendous insights and even been able to incorporate their knowledge into my simulations and added a perspective I, I never would have had otherwise. And the fact that technology allows me to work with anybody all over the world is just incredible. Well, very cool. Speaking of uh, Twitter, I found you, and I am follower number 7,600, so <laughs> I feel pretty good for hitting uh, uh, an even number. Okay. Thank oh. you. <laughs> one, one more complete this sentence. I look forward to the day when I can use technology to... Well, I look forward to the day when I don't feel like I want to throw my laptop out the window. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like every day there's, you know, a new update to this or a new lag or a new issue with that. And uh, that definitely causes, you know, a slowdown in productivity. So I look forward to the day when, you know, we don't have to threaten to throw things off out of a window or off a balcony to get them to work. But surprisingly, when I threaten my laptop, it usually works better afterwards. So it's probably listening it's to listening. me. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, so share something different about your podcast, but uh, we'd like to keep our clean rating on iTunes. Sure. Uh, something different. You know, I've as I've gotten older, I've surprisingly tried to try very new things, and I am fiercely claustrophobic, but I actually started scuba diving, and oh. now that's like a really exciting thing for me, and hopefully I'll be able to try other things that I had thought my claustrophobia would prevent, but it just goes to show you that tastes change, and fear thresholds change and you should always you know reconsider things that you had previously said you'd never try outright you know the safe things that makes sense so where can people learn more about you Milena? sure well um they can learn about versus geopolitical risk practice 
at the Versprite website, versprite.com. Um, and all of my writing and all of my work is on my personal website, melinarodband.com. And I have an upcoming book called Geopolitical Flux, uh, which I'm finishing as we speak. And you'll be the first to know when it's out. <laughs> awesome. awesome. Will you think there'll be an audible version of it, an audiobook version? Uh, I hope so. Yeah, awesome. absolutely. I'm a big fan. <laughs> Awesome. So if you're a big fan of Audible, Audible is a sponsor of the show. Uh, can you recommend a good uh, audio book? Sure. Um, I recently have been a big fan of The Tyranny of Metrics by Jerry Z. Muller. That would probably be of interest to your listeners. Very cool. And um, I'm nice. reading currently The Leadership Leadership Lab by uh, Chris Lewis and Pippa Malmgren, who talk about redefining leadership for the 21st century and including some of the things that we've talked about, which I think is really fascinating. Wow. That's good. I... Uh... I'm a big time uh, Audible junkie, and um, I've had a chance to uh, to uh, I think I'm at 102 books in less than two years, or something ridiculous wow. like that. Yeah, great. I, I was late to the game, but uh, I've been I've been catching up. <laughs> well, uh, too Frank. To be fair, uh, where you live, there's lots and lots of traffic. This is true. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> well, that's one of the. I mean, uh, the traffic aside, I mean, uh, no. where else but like DC would you meet somebody like Milena, who's a who is a geo geopolitical risk consultant, you know, That's like true. what? <laughs> that is just one of those things that just happens in DC. Yep. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in getting, um, not you, Milena, but if our <laughs> listeners are interested in getting into audio books, uh, you can go to the data driven book.com and you'll be taken there and we'll get a, uh, a, a, a enough to buy a cookie somewhere uh help support the show <laughs> <laughs> and uh you get to learn something too so with that anything else uh, you'd like to add melina thank you so much for inviting me I had a great time and awesome. hopefully you know your listeners will learn something that they've never heard before <laughs> awesome thank you thanks for uh joining us anything else andy i uh, know i will say i'm i'm sure our listeners will learn stuff they've never learned before you are our very first geopolitical risk strategist uh, so I am flattered. That, Thank you. There you go. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the show, Melina. This was awesome. Thank you. Love. And with that, I'll let the nice British lady finish the show. Thanks for listening to Data Driven. Don't just listen. Become a data driver by going to datadriven.tv to sign up to join the community, access to special events, tips and tricks, and more. Sign up today at datadriven.tv.